Thanks very much indeed, Ryan. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to welcome you all to this event here tonight at Queen's University, Belfast, and to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest and speaker. Since the EU referendum of 2016, Queen's has endeavoured to produce a space within which we can have public, informed, inclusive dialogue and debate about Brexit and about the challenges and opportunities it presents for us all. And it's as part of that series that tonight we're delighted to welcome Mary Lou MacDonald to come and speak to us. Mary Lou MacDonald, TD for Dublin Central, President of Sinn Féin, is also her party's spokesperson on public expenditure and reform. Educated at Trinity College Dublin, at the University of Limerick and at Dublin City University, Mary Lou MacDonald was, between 2004 and 2009, an MEP, Member of the European Parliament for Dublin, a TD since 2011. She was Vice President of Sinn Féin between 2011 and 2018 and became Sinn Féin President last month. After she's addressed us, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions and for there to be debate and discussion on many of the subjects which will be raised in what Mary Lou says to us tonight. But before that, to speak to us on the subject of Brexit, challenges and opportunities, please, please give a very warm Queen's University Belfast welcome to Mary Lou MacDonald. So, Gurimila Mahagath, Richard, Agus Gurim Mai Agav, Asan Gurim Aratan Sonukth, Ta Oha Sarim Veg Kainch, Eganol Skull, Starul, Kalul, Shaw. So, Ta Kupla Fukula Rogum, Fui Brexit, Sher Dus, Agus Kupla Rod Le Ro Fuin Tauki. I want to thank you for the invitation here to address you this evening um, at this famous and prestigious university and seat of learning. I suppose I should be uh, direct from the outset. I don't believe that there are any opportunities with Brexit. <laughs> you might say that I should end just there, <laughs> but I will continue. Brexit runs contrary to our peace agreements, to our economic interests and to the rights of all of our people. And while there are undoubtedly major issues and legitimate concerns with the direction of the European project, Brexit is not the answer. Brexit reflects the inability of some to reconcile themselves with the present and the need to plan for the future. Those behind Brexit glory in nostalgia for the past, an imperial past that is gone and that is never coming back. Brexit, I believe, is fundamentally about the failure to recognise that our world has moved on, that our world has changed. And it's actually that that I wish to address tonight. Change, the process of change and the challenges of shaping change. I recently attended an event at the Library of Congress in Washington. And at that event, the former chancellor of this university, Senator George Mitchell, said something profound. He said that life is change. That's a very powerful and profound statement of truth. It's true in our personal lives, and it's true in politics also. Nothing stands still, nothing can be taken for granted, and everything that we do provokes a reaction. So we have it in ourselves to be leaders of change. A hundred years ago, women won the right to vote. In the 1918 elections, Irish Republicans swept the boards in what became known as the Sinn Féin election, and the people voted for independence and freedom. The first woman was elected to Westminster, an Irish Republican abstentionist MP, Constance Markievicz. And at that time, the Sinn Féin MPs turned their back on Westminster 
and the first stall was convened in Dublin in 1919. The democratic mandate of 1918 was ignored, and you know the rest, that conflict ensued and partition was imposed on Ireland. And partition became that carnival of reaction that James Connolly had so rightly predicted. In the north, a gerrymandered orange state with an inbuilt unionist majority, a cold house for Catholics. And in the south, a free state where home rule was Rome rule, where theocratic laws and corrupt politics held sway. But those days are over. Ireland has changed. Ireland is changing. The North is changing. And society and politics can no longer be viewed through the simple prism of orange and green. Because we now have Andram Jarig, the red of the Irish language campaign, a campaign for equality spearheaded by a new generation of Irish speakers proud of their culture and promoting the language for all. We have the rainbow of colour that makes up the marriage equality campaign. A new progressive generation is coming to the fore, challenging the old orthodoxies. And I believe that you will see evidence of this in the vibrant repeal the eighth campaign in the coming weeks. That's a campaign that's about trusting women. So modernity beckons and change is all around us. The perpetual unionist majority, the very foundation stone of this state is gone. And the demographic trends here can't be missed. While there are those who may want to stall progress to gerrymander boundaries, to block rights, they can't stop the process of change. Change can be agreed, it can be planned, or it can be reckless and chaotic, but it cannot be stopped. And I believe that we have a responsibility to create a planned and agreed process of change. That's why we need the institutions at Stormont up and running. That's why we need the foundations of the Good Friday Agreement, equality, rights and respect back in place. And that's why the process of reconciliation is so crucial, because we all need to move forward together. You all know that we're at a tough place at the moment. And I know that dealing with a very changed society is difficult for many, including many within unionism. For over 14 months, we negotiated with the DUP. We reached an accommodation with their leadership. That draft agreement, whilst not meeting all of our proposals, did represent progress and provided the basis to re-establish power sharing. The DUP leadership were unable to deliver that draft agreement. And I say this not to recriminate, but to register my deep disappointment. The issues at stake, the rights of Irish speakers as agreed at St Andrews, the legacy mechanisms agreed in Stormont House, and the right to marriage equality available in the South and across Britain, all of those issues remain. And these rights can no longer be delayed because a right delayed is a right denied. So it's time to move on, to implement the agreements and to secure these rights. Let me say that any proposal for a shadow assembly is not a move forward. It represents a step away from power sharing. A shadow assembly would make us all bystanders to direct rule giving a veneer of accountability to direct rule, and Sinn Féin will not countenance direct rule. So, in order to re-establish genuine power sharing, the two governments must convene the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. That intergovernmental conference must produce a plan, a pathway to bring forward the legislation and resources to secure these rights and to implement the agreements. And the governments must secure these rights consistent with the agreements to loosen the political deadlock and to provide a way back to genuine power sharing. This is a pragmatic and a common sense approach. It's a challenge to the British government 
which is now dependent on the DUP, and it's also a significant challenge to the DUP to embrace the spirit of power sharing and full equality. I believe the power sharing institutions are the best, the only option to, for, to chart a way forward together and to navigate the big societal change that we face. As our society changes, so reconciliation and respect come to the fore. Because without these, the future is one of segregation and polarisation, and that is in nobody's interest. We need a society at peace with itself, a society that reflects our common humanity, a society that respects diversity and embraces difference, a reconciled and inclusive society. I believe that reconciliation is, about, is as much about shaping the future as it is about healing the past. It's a year since we lost Martin McGuinness, and as Sinn Féin leader, I want to build on his work, reaching out the hand of friendship and understanding. I have no interest in fighting the battles of the past. I see absolutely no value in the blame game. Nobody should be asked to forget, and nobody should be expected to forgive if they cannot. There is no one historical narrative or one simple truth. We must only agree that what happened in the past must never, ever happen again. And then we must be able to agree to disagree on some things and to move forward together. To a society where you can comfortably be Irish or British or neither or both. Life has changed and Ireland is changing. Unionism needs to engage with that process of change, to think the unthinkable. Many unionists will privately acknowledge change. That acknowledgement must now find public expression. So let's plan a future for all of our children. I'm an Irish Republican. I'm a united Irelander, a most unmanageable of revolutionaries a believer in the unity of all of our people in all of our diversity. I believe that we can find common ground and build a new agreed Ireland of prosperity and opportunity, of equal rights in which everyone has a place. An Ireland that provides jobs, homes and health care for all our citizens. An Ireland where everyone has a place in society and a fair chance to succeed. An Ireland where it's about who you are and not about who you know. An Ireland where the politics of the past, the nod and wink politics of the past, remains in the past. And unionist citizens, communities and their identity must be a central component in the building of this new United Ireland. Unionists must have the same sense of ownership as Irish nationalists and Republicans. So, we are looking to build something entirely novel, entirely new and commonly shared. Now, some, as the song may say, some of you may say I'm a dreamer. To John Lennon fans, that will mean something. To others, it may not. You might say that the ideas I've set out are fanciful, that it's simply rhetoric. Well, I say that these ambitions are grounded in hope, and in confidence of our collective strength. This institution received its charter 173 years ago. This institution has borne witness to the radical changes in Belfast and to our shared history. A century ago, the first woman MP was elected. 30 years ago, conflict raged with no sign of ending and no notion that unionism and nationalism, that the DUP and Sinn Féin would share power. But here we are today. The conflict is over. The pr principles of power sharing are established. And now it's time to start the healing. The question for all of us is, 
Where do we want to be in 30 years' time? We have the opportunity, and I believe the duty, to put things right. So we need to tackle sectarianism head on. And I want to be clear, by the way, in saying this, I don't mean disrespecting people's beliefs, their cultures or their churches. Religious freedom, civil liberties and separating church and state are the essential dynamics of an open democratic system of governance. They're also the building blocks of our new Ireland. Our laws, our constitution, constitutional and cultural frameworks, our public policies must be built on the fundamental equality of every single citizen. So the choices we make today, including around Brexit, will shape our future. George Mitchell said that life is change. So let's prepare for and shape that change. Let's imagine that new Ireland, a reconciled Ireland, a modern Ireland, in which citizens have equal rights and respect. An Ireland where identities, British, Irish and others, are shared and celebrated. This is, I believe, the challenge of our generation. And it will call for patience and generosity, ingenuity and courage. And so, my friends, may we possess these virtues in abundance for the journey that lies ahead. Gurumila Mahogov. chairperson by starting with one if I may. Um, you started out by saying that from your point of view there seem not to be opportunities in Brexit but there are challenges. Some people have argued that from the perspective of someone who would like to see the end of partition, who would like to see United Ireland, one of the implications of Brexit has been to push somewhat in that direction. In other words, that the nationalist opinion in the north has turned more hostilely towards a partitionist arrangement. There would seem to be possible developments which would fracture the UK between Britain and the North, possibly even between England and Scotland again. Are there, from a, an Irish Republican perspective, even though I respect that you're hostile to Brexit, are there opportunities that might emerge in terms of that agenda which have to some extent been accelerated by the Brexit development? Well, I, I, I think it is uh, obvious and fair to say that Brexit certainly has put the issue of partition and the border front and centre. I think we all know that. By the way, I would not assume from that simply that inevitably partition ends and inevitably we move to Irish unity. I don't think that's an inevitability, but certainly the discussion is now live in a way that I certainly can never recall uh, in the past. But when I say that there's no opportunities in, in Brexit, and by the way, I don't want us to get to Irish unity by you know, some opportunistic turn of fate or some sleight of hand. The new Ireland and the united Ireland has to be actively embraced, and we need to build maximum consensus. That's not to say that anyone can have a veto on it or make it stop. But as Democrats and as mature citizens, you have to maximise consensus in a healthy society. So just to make that point. But the bigger issue for Brexit is, I believe, what does it do in terms of, firstly, the peace agreements? And although the United States is cred credited as being the, I suppose, the, the political midwife of those agreements, the reality is that they were built and constructed very much within the European Union legal and administrative framework. And therefore, any withdrawal from that throws the thing into disarray. I mean, I would go so far as to say that Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement are simply not compatible. By definition, Brexit undermines all of those governance arrangements, the human rights standards and criteria, the rights of citizens, and, and, and. And then the second bit is, well, what does Brexit do for Ireland as a whole, economically and in terms of trade? And the reality is that it is catastrophic. I mean, the idea, think about this, because I think sometimes we have delusions of scale. Like, we're a small island. 
we need to kind of just get to grips. We're, you know, we're not some vast, sprawling territory. We're a very small island, you know, an offshore island from mainland Europe. Consider the absolute uh, madness of having one part of a small island inside the European Union with all that entails and the other side, the other piece outside. Two sets of rules and regulations, two sets of standards and all of that. And I think people involved in industry, whether it's an indigenous industry, whether it's the corporates that are based on this island, understand full well that that's simply not a tenable proposition. Or it is if you want to lose jobs and if you want to lose investment. And I don't think any of us are in the business uh, of that. So when I balance things out and I say there's no opportunity, um, let me go further and say, actually, we, we face a huge challenge here. We need to be very united. And you see the political or identity issues that might separate us or distinguish us from each other. That's fine. All of that is still there. That will still be there post-Brexit. But in the here and now, we need to have a very disciplined and thoughtful view uh, of how we live, our standard of living, how we live together, and how we build prosperity, not least. So Brexit is, in my mind, also a threat to, to Irish prosperity. And I've never bought the line from some British uh, political people and commentators that say, this will be fabulous. We will go, you know, heroically into the world market and cut deals left, right and centre. I mean, if you read the tea leaves, all of the evidence is actually to the contrary. What you're seeing is uh, an American administration and others to now talk up protectionism and barriers and, and walls in a way, again, that I've never heard before. So there's something otherworldly about some of the wish list of, of Brexit. We're not going to be, in my view, the collateral damage for a decision that was taken in Britain. People here in the north of Ireland voted by a majority to remain. And I think that needs to be remembered too. Thank you very much. There are roving microphones which will go to where the questions come from. Who will start us off with the first question? Over here, down at the front, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Several questions in one. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, just to say in response to that, all of the above and more needs to be on the table. Like, it would be, it'd be pretty stupid of me now to say, I want to, we want to have a dialogue. We want to have a discussion. We have to build this thing together. However, the following ideas are not to be considered. That's not the spirit or the way to come at it. Obviously, for me, we all have our flags. The tricolour is my flag. That's, that's culturally, I have, I have a huge emotional attachment like lots of people. But I have to tell you, um, in order to build a new society and a shared society, I'm certainly willing to, to put that on the table and to discuss it. I'm certainly willing and actually very interested to hear the ideas and options in terms of how do we govern. You know, is it, how do, what does that look like regionally? Does storm and stay, does it go? I mean, it's absolutely huge. If, if it's not a seat of government, we're going to have to put our thinking caps on as to what we do with it. Um, and, and the key to all of this will be dialogue. So there can't be any taboos. I said in my remarks about thinking the unthinkable. And we need to challenge ourselves and test ourselves and not allow 
the future that we can put together to be bound by our own hang-ups or, or even our, our own emotional stuff. We, we need to address all of that. So if Bertie Ahern said this, that those were wise words from, from the former Taoiseach. Uh, and certainly I think, and I, I'm, I'm sensing that you also think, that uh, all of those things need to be on the table. I, d I don't have all the answers. Actually, I don't think it would be healthy if anyone was presenting themselves here saying, we have it all worked out. That's what you call a fait accompli. We're not in that business. We're in the business of dialogue and engagement. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question down here. I'll sit at the front. Thank you. The anticipation. So there's a lot of here. steps there. Yeah, we like to have the pressure built yes. up. Yes. Yeah, right down the front, Alison. Thanks for that. All we need is a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we now, I knew there were 40 shades of green. I now discover there are 40 shades of orange, which, which undoubtedly, which undoubtedly there are. So um, notwithstanding the current status, there, there is no other option than dialogue. That, that's, just, that's just a reality. So whatever delays there might be, however circuitous the route, it brings us back to talking to each other because we're all here. We live together, you know? So there isn't an option beyond that. We have to be talking to each other. And for my part, uh, I work on the basis that uh, you, you have to get to meet people, to listen to them, to talk to them, to get to know them because that's the only way that you can actually fully start to explore not just commonality but difference. Sometimes the big challenges but the, the the really big boon for everyone is in actually the, the differences because you're, you bring that to the table so we're we're open to that it is important to say this where you talk about Sinn Féin and the DUP D, the DUP are for Brexit we are not there will not be a meeting of minds on that issue so I don't want to mislead you even if we had the institutions back up tomorrow there is still that sharp difference there I think it's very regrettable that the DUP has signed up to uh, do whatever you want type of formula with the Tories. I think that's dangerous. I think it's very unwise. Um, but having said all of that, of course, in terms of attracting investment, looking after the interests of farmers uh, and rural communities, urban communities, the needs of universities and places of learning to have access to Erasmus and other schemes, to collaborate for academics to actually do their work and keep at the, the, the top edge 
of, of whatever their discipline uh, is. I am assuming that there is uniformity, like motherhood and apple pie, to actually pursue those things. We, we need the institutions back up and running. If you want my view, I think it's an absolute disgrace that we don't have an assembly and an executive, an absolute disgrace. I'm deeply frustrated by that fact. I'm doubly frustrated because, as I said in my remarks, we did actually find that accommodation. A lot of people said, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to agree on language. You're simply not. You're not going to find a pathway in terms of marriage equality because the positions were so different. Well, if nothing else, we proved that, in fact, it was possible. The difficulty was that it wasn't delivered. But I want to take hope from the fact that through that dialogue with all sorts of pigmentations um, of unionism, that we manage to get to that place and we need to get back there. I, I've suggested a method that I think is the most efficient way uh, to get us very smartly into a position where we can have that dialogue to get government, power sharing government, not just devolved, but power sharing government back up and running. I think that's in all of our interests. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mary Lou. There was a question over here, several questions, just behind you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, lasagna, I presume. Uh, you said at the start that a right to live is a right to night, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be very insular now about Queen's University. You may have noticed recently there was protests over Irish language signage in the university. I was wondering, have you had the opportunity yet to talk to the management of Queen's University on this issue? And if you haven't yet, maybe you could use this very public opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, uh, I am aware of, of the call for signage. It's something that I would personally support. I, th I, I, I think it's something, a place that you need to get to. I would imagine, although I can't speak on behalf of the university, that there needs to be a, perhaps a process. It can't go on forever. But, but I talked about this thing of maximizing consensus. I think there should be a real uh, effort made to talk as, as a body of students in a respectful way in a way that is calming uh, around this issue. And yes, I think there should be bilingual signage. I remember coming and going from the, uh, from the talks that I just referred to, and I was listening to some of the media commentary on Achtana Gaelga, and I thought it was frankly off the wall. I mean, it, it, it created an anxiety and a pressure that was entirely unfounded. So for anybody who has no interest in Angaelga, who never wishes to have a word, a fuckle or a bit, past their lips. Let me just say this. No one is going to force anyone ever to speak Irish. It's not going to happen. This is not some sort of uh, cultural, uh, you know, roller coaster to kind of gang press people. This is simply about affording, affording people who have an interest in the language, who use the, who are Gael Gory, to, to, to go about their business and to have that respected and, and, uh, and acknowledged. And I, I got very, I got very annoyed actually at times listening to some of the, the commentary on it was, it was frankly as I say off the wall. So yes, I, I, I would support the, the, the bilingual signage, and I would also say by way of uh, a piece of advice or a suggestion, to actually rather than getting into conflict with each other, to actually try a process of engagement. And for anybody who's who's hostile to bilingual bilingual. Uh, signage. I, I would just point you to uh, a very fine woman by the name of Linda Irvine. She's a Gaelgore. She's certainly not uh, a, a Republican uh, like myself, but she's a lover of the language. And I noticed that she tweeted with her husband. They were driving through, I think, some part of Wales. And she said, I've just read a whole lot of Welsh uh, signage. I still feel very, very British. And let me assure you that no sign is going to change somebody's sense of uh, identity and national identity, nor should it. Irish language activists shouldn't, uh, for a second, and don't uh, present the language as an affront to another. That's not what language is about. That's not what culture is about. It's shared for everybody who, who has an interest and indeed a love of it. Thank you very much. This question right down at the left there, Kevin. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, John Brewer from the Liberty Institute. Um, it strikes me that one could describe the Northern Ireland peace process as a bit like driving a car 
is only looking in the rearview mirror. Everybody knows if you drive a car and only look in the rearview mirror, you'll crash before you get to the end of the drive. What I liked very much about your talk, in fact, it's one of the few talks I've heard from a Northern Irish politician, uh, which uh, paints a vision of the future. <laughs> Uh, it strikes me thus that uh, uh, one could argue that the problem in, uh, in the North is not so much political but moral, in that we are lacking a moral framework in which we can discuss uh, the future, in which we can discuss a shared society. Uh, because there are too many politicians up here who are frightened of the future, and I think that we need to encourage a more healthier debate about what the future should look like. And that's a moral <coughs> question as much as a political one. Thanks, John. So, John, I have to advise you, I'm a dub. <laughs> uh, don't, don't all cheer at once. So listen, whatever divisions there are here, I, we are actually the oppressed minority because it's, it's very decidedly 31 against one. I, and I know that. I take your point. I think I, I'm not so sure that there is. Uh, I would be very, very slow and very cautious about identifying moral deficits uh, in in the body uh, politic. They they may or may not be there. I, I think certainly, I I do believe that we need to take account of the past, but not to gaze endlessly in the rear view mirror. But we also have to recognise that, you know, that's still with people now, in the here and now, it's, it, it, it's carried into the present. But I also think we need a discussion around, you know, the democratic kind of vibe that we want to live in. So let's take the issue of marriage equality, and there's probably mixed views in this hall. I strongly take the view that whatever your moral, your own personal conscience positions on some of what are considered, you know, um, controversial social issues, that's fine. Each of us is entitled to our conscience. But you're not entitled to demand a legal framework, an apparatus that actually denies other citizens their freedoms. So there's a balance to be... And I think there's a conversation... And by the way, this isn't uniquely a Northern thing. This is an Irish conversation that we need to have with each other. Because what I described earlier, and I'm very conscious of this because I'm a Dubliner, that very often it's a discussion about Ireland and it's almost a finger wagging at the North. You know, how, how, how awful and how divided and how blinded everything is up here. And, and then we're not always very good at looking at ourselves until things like Magdalen Homes and Mother and Baby Homes and, 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 I could go on. Uh, and let me tell you, when, when the country got partitioned, the Northern state was deeply toxic. That's just a fact. Um, but let me tell you, the southern, the southern part was toxic too. And in fairness to unionism of the time, they had a point when they said that home rule is Rome rule. And the, the southern state went on to demonstrate that amply and in a way that was deeply damaging for people. Um, but in a way, you know, when we went out and voted for marriage equality in the referendum, that to me as an Irish citizen said, that's over now, that's now over. And I think it's great that it's over because I think it gives us the latitude, the space and the capacity to have those conversations. I don't know, John, if they're moral, they're certainly ethical, they're certainly about a civic ethic, they're about civic manners, civic dialogue. Um, and I, I think there are things that we can actually find a lot of very, very common ground, because that to me, this is about modernising Ireland and saying, wakey, wakey, it's 2018, shake a leg, politicians, and step into that, step into that reality. Thank you. There was a question here, and a question over the left. Just, that's right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for being here. You're very welcome. Um, I have two questions. The, uh, the politics of the Conservative Party, there seems to be convulsions really uh, within the party, which makes the management of Brexit deeply problematic for the Dublin government and uh, for those of us here. So 
sometimes it looks like a, a symptom of post-imperial stress disorder. <laughs> you might say, this to the word. <laughs> My second question, um, is Brexit a good moment for an institution like Queen's to look at its own all-island or cross-border relationships as an institution? Is this a good time to think about reaching out and establishing that more of a all <coughs> island uh, footprint as, a, as an institution within the higher education community on the island? Thank you. Well, the answer to the <coughs> second part is yes. Um, I think I think it's not not only is that a good and healthy thing to do, it's probably a very pragmatic and smart thing to do as well. I I would think. Um, the Tory uh, party is the Tory party. Um. And yes, the, the whole thing is, is really quite uh, unstable. And, and I mean, I, I heard at one stage Boris Johnson talking about, you know, dispensing with the Good Friday Agreement simply to pursue what, what he wishes to see, you know, this hard Brexit. I mean, really dangerous, dangerous rhetoric. And he needs to be reminded that it's not actually his agreement. It's not his agreement to bin. It's not the Tories' uh, agreement to bin either. So that, that very sort of cavalier, almost thinking out loud and thinking very flawed thoughts uh, at very high volume is, is, is not helpful. My frustration with them at the minute is that uh, I've no sense of a plan. I mean, we've waited and waited. The, the British government don't like the European backstop. The European backstop simply says in legal text, which is what the, the agreement has to be, that the North, that we, that we need to overcome the challenges of the common market, uh, the common, uh, or the customs union and the single market. It doesn't go as far as I would wish it to go, but that's the basic concept. The British government said, we don't like that. Okay, you don't like that. So tell us what the answer is. And we're still waiting. And we, we got told by David Davis, and you actually couldn't make this up, that the alternative is option A, full stop. Like that's not good enough. And all of that delay adds to the anxiety and the uncertainty for communities, for services, for business, for investors, for, for you know, life in, in, in this uh, university. So um, there has been a stalling tactic. I, I think perhaps some of them think that maybe the Europeans will blink I think uh, they, they certainly have as an objective to push Ireland, the Irish question, down the pipe and just get on with you know, the important question of the future relationship. We have an undertaking, and certainly the government in Dublin has an undertaking, that that's not going to happen. Donald Tusk described it as a policy of Ireland first. Whatever about the efficacy of using those particular words, um, that's how it ha has to happen. So. June, come the summertime, I think it would be deeply, deeply problematic if we come to the summer months, and by that I mean June, and we don't have anything on the table from the British government. I, I think then we have a, a crunch moment, and I, I would be expecting and, and saying to the government in, in Dublin that that really needs to be a, a crunch point. It cannot be deferred into the autumn with the objective of, Britain hoping that it will go away. Thank you. Next question is over here on the left. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to wait or forego my question if there's a woman that wants to ask a question. Right? Um, I think there is there, but we'll hit you first and then we'll go to the question there. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. I'm John Eversett from uh, University College Cork. Um, and I was thinking when you were talking about the coverage of uh, Achna Gwelega, um and the <laughs> Uh, the nature of the coverage of the talks process more generally. And I remember kind of waiting for the, the tidbit that was going to come from uh, Barney Rowan uh, or, um, you know, that was going to be leaked to Slugger O'Toole or wherever it might be. And I was wondering if uh, the, the atmosphere in which these negotiations take place now is very different to the one that pertained uh, in 1998, for example, or even in the early... 2000s, um, and I wondered whether the uh, secrecy that is perhaps, uh, or the privacy that is perhaps a necessary condition of effective negotiations is also part of the problem. It creates a vacuum in which 
um, <coughs> certain kinds of claims can be made and, and not refuted. And then when it, the agreement, the draft agreement, uh, eventually was revealed, um, you know, uh, were there then too many surprises, perhaps, or an inability to do the work to bring um, the varying shades of orange, I quite like that, um, mm -hmm. on a journey uh, to the acceptance of uh, an Irish Language Act, for example, in, a, in an age defined by uh, social media, by 24-hour uh, rolling news coverage, does the way that negotiations take place maybe have to change in order to guarantee a restoration of power sharing? Thank you. Well, I, I actually don't think that the, and I'm glad you used the word, you said secrecy and then you said privacy. Mm -hmm. um, in order to have the discussions in good faith with anybody, when you're trying to sort something out, there has to be a level of privacy. I mean, if for instance, at the end of every conversation, one or other of us is running down and spilling the beans or we're tweeting live or live streaming our conversations. It's a guarantee you're not going to get anywhere. But I think there is a distinction to be made between privacy and secrecy and I think that's a useful thing. I think where things fall down and perhaps where this fell down was a failure to prepare the base for what was coming. Um, and you have to do that. You see, when you're... Uh, negotiating or, or trying to strike a deal on anything and particularly issues that have become quite politically charged if you want to deliver the org the the agreement at the end you have to have done the work you, do, you don't get away with uh, shortcuts so we would be very conscious of keeping the lines of communication open with our own party with our own base with with broader with broader society we don't always get it a hundred percent right you know, it's, it can be very challenging, but it has to be done. And if you position yourself politically where you create uh, a, a, such tension around an issue like language rights, and it, bear in mind, weapons were dealt with, prisoners were dealt with, you know, um, and, and caused you know, deep, deep-seated angst on all, for, on the part of all communities. So let's ask ourselves now in real terms with a little bit of enlightenment, how is it or why is it that a sim simple thing like the Via Kainsha Skelga has the potential or got, got you know, you, you know into, that, into that position? So curry my yogurt, calling people crocodiles, all of that stuff has an emotive reaction. That happened. Now, we need to come back from that. that. That's the bottom line. We need to come back from it. And we need to do it in a way that is just enlightened and respectful. It's not okay to disrespect people like that. It, it, it annoys people. It gets people's heckles up. And you make it then, you know, a crunch issue. And it, it, it takes on a whole dynamic that then puts lots of people on the defence so for, for no good reason. Language rights threaten nobody. They threaten absolutely nobody. Uh, and that's the reality. So that type of conversation, I think, needed to happen in a broad way. And I, I'm very conscious that I, I, I'm, I'm a Republican. I'm a nationalist leader. I would like to think that some of what I might say would have resonance with unionists or with unionism. But I'm also conscious that Unionist leaders need to lead there. And I, I frankly, I don't think that they did on that particular issue that, that you raised. Thank you. There was a question about halfway up there, just by the cabin. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Hello. Um, it just teed up my question perfectly. Is it okay? I'll ask Alan just a few questions. The first one is um, Do you think the rights of Irish language speakers will be diminished in the event of Brexit in the North? And the second one is you're talking about equality of access. My question is, how do you ensure equality of access to the Irish language for the unionist community in the event of the fact that that the DUP are opposed to the Irish language? I'm sure you know it's Irish language is not taught in controlled schools in the north. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I think to take heart from what's happening, 
you have to look to the, the, the language community itself. Um, and the fact that so many children now are educated through Gaelic, they're in Nínra, they're in the Bunska, they're in the Manskullana. And if you like, the genie is out of the bottle, if I, can, if I can put it that way. Because the language is, despite everything, despite everything, the language is thriving. So I think the best guarantor, actually, for the future of the language and for sharing it uh, in a way that encompasses all of society is actually the, the Irish language activists and Gael Gorey themselves. You couldn't have been but impressed when you saw all of the, the dram jarig out uh, in their thousands. And, and the striking thing, and it was the same actually years ago when we were, were campaigning for Stádas for the Irish language at a European level, the activists were very young then and they're very young now. So that tells you something. That tells you about the impulse and the dynamic of, of, of the younger generations coming through. And that's, that's actually the most important thing. The, the key to Brexit or no Brexit, whatever way uh, things figure out, the core to actually having a shared goodwill towards the language uh, is for people to take a couple of steps back and to just insist that there be rationality and fairness and fair play in terms of dealing with this issue. And for some people to kind of climb down off a high horse that says, Octa um, Gaelge equals the end of the world. You know, I mean, come on, come on. That's, that's not, I don't believe anybody in their heart of hearts buys that. So we need to get to that place. In terms of the, the uh, access to north-south cooperation and, and, and investment, I mean, that's one of the things. There's 142 different areas of north-south cooperation. There may, in fact, be more. Uh, and one of the dilemmas that, that uh, Brexit throws up is governance for those structures, investment in those structures. But to answer your question, where you have a, a significant part of the body politic that is hostile to the language it certainly doesn't help but but it will not stop i want to emphasize that it won't stop irish language activists or, or the growth and proliferation of irish schools and 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 all of that thank you also there's a question down at the front here thank you thank you very much for your your talk um, my name is ben Ashton. Um, i just would like to play So uh, the, sort of the language that's been used tonight has been uh, quite nationalistic, and it's language that I would associate in England with, with the Leavers. And I just wondered um, if you could um, kind of square the circle for me between uh, that kind of rhetoric and um, wanting to stay in the European Union, which has um, successively, progressively eroded the concept of, of a nation state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I, I don't know that, uh, first of all, let's just think about the concept of nationalism. I remember when I was an MEP, I discovered very quickly that in Europe you don't describe yourself as a nationalist because it means something entirely different. It means something xenophobic and small and nasty and exclusionary. Um, where in fact for Irish nationalists, I suppose it might be more akin to a, a South American nationalism that's about liberation and freedom and moving beyond and past experiences of occupation and, and colonization and so forth. So I just want to say that my brand of, as describing myself as a nationalist, that's what I mean. I don't mean um, uh, a narrow-minded exclusionary view. I, 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 I detest that type of politics. I want an Ireland that is um, literally, as I described, multicultural and multicoloured. I think we were all far too pale for far too long. I think diversity is good. I wish to actively encourage it. Um, so my issue and our issue as, 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 a, as a party that would describe ourselves as Eurocritical um, not Eurosceptic, Euroscepticism is, is a very sort of British concept, I think. 
uh, is to say I don't like the fact that the European framework currently says to me we have all of these social provisions but when it comes down to it the market will always will always trump those pardon the pun um, I don't like the fact that the European Union insists on a common foreign and security policy and completely ignores the experience, traditions and values of military neutrals. I don't like the fact that the, the Union is increasingly militarised and aligned with NATO. I don't like any of those things. But the, the question then becomes, is Brexit an answer to that? And patently it's not, not least because the Tories that sponsored this expedition into the unknown are ones that thought the working time directed was an offence against humanity. You know, the idea of saying, well, actually, there needs to be a legal framework that limits the number of hours uh, that people work was to them horrific. When I was an MEP, I could not believe how actively and how often they campaigned against all of that. The, the Brexit uh, expedition is premised on a dislike for freedom of movement of people. I happen to think as Europeans, freedom of movement is, is brilliant. It means you can work, you can study, you can travel, at right across the, all of those are good things. So I square that circle, if you like, actually quite, uh, quite easily, because it is my view that we stand our ground within the European Union. As people that are Eurocritical, we're not on our own. I would hope that the whole Brexit thing has, has finally woken up the system to the fact that they can't blindly just keep going on and pretending that they don't hear the critical voices. Those voices have to be heard. But I'm for standing our ground, standing our corner, and not conceding the European project to the corporates and, and simply to big business and to people who would have a view of the world that is very, very different from mine. Thank you. There are many more questions. We have time only for one more, I'm afraid. Just here, just three rows behind you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mary Lee, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your perspective on the challenges and opportunities. Uh, as you can probably guess, I'm a Scotsman. I hear that. Scotsman from St Andrews. I live in Belfast and I'm proud to be studying here at Queen's. I really enjoyed the fact that you mentioned Senator George Mitchell and his comments about life is change. I also was really <coughs> interested when you mentioned political midwife when you spoke to Professor Richard. I wondered if you would share with us, do you believe we need another political midwife? If so, who? And if <coughs> not, what change what change would you like to see to get the talks and the process up and running? Thank you. Thank you. I feel like bursting into Flower of Scotland and <laughs> thanking you for all those easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a, uh, an initiative uh, by the, the American administration to, to uh, appoint a special envoy. Uh, actually, we raised this issue when we met with the State Department when visiting for the St. Patrick's Day period. Uh, I have absolutely no idea who that might be. Um, nor do I at this stage have a sense of the parameters of engagement that that person might have. But I think we should look on an initiative like that positively. Because I think anything that brings just a new, a fresh set, pair of, a set of legs a, a, a fresh pair of eyes, a different view, sometimes a challenging view, uh, cannot do any harm. So in principle, I think that that's a good thing. We were advised that this plan is very much uh, on the front burner. So we'll see where, where that goes. What needs to happen? I, I mean, I think I, I set it out there in my comments. I'm not going to ask people uh, here in the north of Ireland to wait and to wait and to cross your fingers and hope that someday, somewhere, you know, somebody might decide to move on what are very modest asks. I'm certainly not going to ask families who have waited decades for an inquest. And by the way, this is across community. This isn't, these includes families who would have been, people who would have been hurt, injured or killed by IRA actions. 
So this is a this is a whole of society issue. I'm not going to suggest that those families wait and wait and hope that someday the British government actually release the funding as uh, defined by the Chief Justice. That needs to happen now. As a matter of fact, I think it's absolutely outrageous and shocking that any democratic government would sit by and say, well, we're going to make you wait, I don't know, it, it, with a view to using that as a bargaining chip to punish us because we couldn't get the deal finished or to incentivize us back to the negotiating table. I think that's frankly disgraceful. And I, I have told Mrs. May and Karen Bradley my view on it. And I'm happy to put it on the record here today. But on the other issues and, and on that, we're not going to ask people to wait. We, we need answers. We need answers to these questions. So, And we also need to carry out our work within the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. So what I think should happen is that uh, the Intergovernmental Conference be convened. And I think at that, the items for discussion are the outstanding issues, the legislative requirements, the resource requirements. And then the two governments, because bear in mind, they carry the duty for delivery of equality. Um, in terms of the respective jurisdictions. So we're staying within the free, the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. They need to come up then and say, right, this is what's going to happen to resolve and answer these questions. And then I would hope that good sense, that common sense would prevail and that we can talk about a programme for government. We can talk about transformation in the health service. We can talk about uh, investment in skills development and education. We can talk about quality jobs, secure jobs. We can talk about the measures that will keep lots of you who are studying here now, that will actually give you the option to, to, to settle here, to live your lives here and, and to create a society where you only go by choice. You don't go because you really had no other option. Those things really, really matter. And I think that we can get to grips with those issues, but only when we get the answers to the outstanding issues. And then we have to move forward on the basis of what power sharing was always about. Not one up manship or one up womanship. Not about looking down your nose at anybody or thinking you're better or that you're more entitled and somebody else has no entitlements. This has to be about realization of full citizenship. And that threatens no one. In fact, I believe that that's the thing that sets people free. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming and supporting an excellent session. This is exactly the kind of thing which Queen's is really committed to hosting open discussion, debate, inclusive dialogue, and thank you for supporting it. I hope you'll, we'll see you all at future events at Queen's. Mary Lou, you can tell how excited people have been to engage with you. We hope we'll have you here many times again in Queen's. But for an excellent talk and a wonderful engagement with questions, let's show our appreciation for Mary Lou McDonald. <laughs>